and welcome to um, okay good morning everyone and um, we really appreciate the attendance and welcome to um, our new members including people from um, the uk and, and and other parts of the world um, it's my privilege to introduce um, martin Elizabeth this morning um, some of you have previously attended his part one presentation on mountain passes of the cape um, you'll see just now the reason that he has this wonderful um, collection of trips and pictures that he is accumulating. Um, just by way of background, Martin hails from Thunderbell Park. He was um, born there, went to school there. Um, he worked in our prison services for, for many years um, and then became a, a broker. He owned a pub. He was in the furniture manufacturing service and then he saw the light in 2005 and moved to Hermanus. Um, we met him here in 2015 when we bought and moved to Hermanus. He's also a very good um, handyman and, and, and uh, painter. So that's how we met him. And, and he also takes wonderful, um, wonderful pictures. Um, he's very, very smart with the drone. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Martin. Um, and we look forward to your part two, Martin, and thereafter, I guess, um, not too far away, part three. Yes, yeah. thank you, thank you, over to you. Okay, thank you. Good, Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, we, uh, as John said, we, we moved down to Hermanus in 2005. I think the best move that we've, we've made in our life. Um, a very nice area to stay in um, with all the beauty that's that's around us um, yeah the the mountain passes in the western cape i think is, is some of the nicest mountain passes in the country it's uh, accessible to us where we stay so that makes it even more special there's quite a few passes up in kwazulu natal and the drakensberg and so and the old eastern transvaal which is now in Bumalanga. So yeah, all over the country, we've got these, these fantastic uh, passes that we, we can drive and still enjoy. Now, there's just a little bit of a background. Again, saying how blessed we are to stay here, be able to travel. And uh, now that's my trusted motorbike that I do all my exploring on, uh, do a lot of travel on it. Um, quite a nice way to get out there on the dirt roads, uh, exploring. Also, with a motorbike, uh, it's much easier to stop beside the road and uh, look at the surroundings, whereas in a vehicle, you sometimes have to drive past scenery before you can stop. So a motorbike, definitely an advantage uh, to my mean. Uh, then we've got a, a map, a little map that I've drawn up last night. And this is just the Western Cape. Uh, we, we've got all these beautiful mountain passes. And uh, I quickly had a glance over this map. And I would say that I have ridden about 99% of all of these passes. Um, to the north of Mossel Bay, there is uh, the Atakwas Kluif Pass that I haven't done. It's uh, only doable by a 4 by 4 and you've got to have permits and... Uh, yeah, so that's that's also a nice road to take. I've done the Robinsons Pass, which is just south of that. But yeah, all of these passes, uh, about 50% tar, 50% gravel. Uh, I prefer the gravel roads, uh, less traffic, and uh, much more enjoyable to travel these passes. Right, so we'll start this morning with the Nivetlu of Pass. Um, as a keen motorbike rider and a camper, I've heard a lot about Beaverlac, uh, which is north of Porterville. And um, I've tried to get to it and, and never actually took the opportunity going to, to Beaverlac. Whereas uh, about two weeks, three weeks ago, I took the motorbike and uh, it was time to go and explore and see how the uh, area looks there. Now, the Nivetluf Pass, also known as the Rodezand Pass or the Tolbach Kluf, is uh, crosses the Obikwa Mountains in a kluf created by the Kleinberg River. 
Uh, it allows eastward access from Cape Town and the Swartland into the Tolbach Basin and then onwards to, to the Breda River Valley. Now, in the early days of European settlement at the Cape, there was only three routes permitted the passage of ox wagon through the chain of unbroken mountains, uh, running north to south and isolating Cape Town from the interior. Um, it, it was the Ganto in the south. Now, the Ganto Pass is very close to where Sir Lowry's Pass is now. Uh, one can actually uh, hike up to the Ganto Pass and there's still uh, tracks of the ox wagons that actually went through there. So, but that's not a drivable pass anymore. You can, you can actually hike it. And then the Pekingese Kloof Pass, uh, it's on the way to Citrus Dole. Um, that's to the north. And then uh, the Ruedesan Pass, which was about midway between them. And in 1805, the growing village of Ruedesan was renamed to Tolbach. Now, Ruedesan apparently came from all the red hills that was there. Um, and there was a landjost that was stationed there. Now, travels and residents took a referring to Nivetluov as the Tolbach uh, and the name persisted. The toll gate was installed on the road in 1807, and at about this time, Charles Mitchell uh, began, became, began looking into ways by which the road to Ruetluov could be upgraded. Now, the famous pass builder Thomas Bain surveyed the cliff in 1855 and uh, then suggested a new route along the western side or left bank of the Klein River, Kleinberg River. A recommendation which was followed in 1859 and to up to 1860 and was to carry traffic for the next 100 years. So a railway line was also added to the left bank between the years 1873 and 1874. So it's quite a while back. And then when an increase in traffic volume demanded a new route construction returned to the right bank and a modern road was opened in 1968. Um, I actually find this pass a little bit boring, if I may say. Um, it's just a road basically going through Kluif, but uh, yeah, there you can see there's just some text about the, the pass. Um, this is the information board uh, that was put up in more or less the center of the pass. Um, it's a it's a nice road to take, um, but yeah, it's 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 just another tar road going through the Uh For me, not one of the the most best passes. I will uh, go out to and to drive it. Right then, going up to Beaverlake, as I said, that was my main objective. Of getting to Beaverlac. Um, I pass through Portable and uh, then get to you get to the turn off where you go to Gordo or the Dust Club Pass. Um, now it's summiting um, at about 700 meters above sea level, and one can see the Swartland uh, landscape at the bottom. You can really see very, very far. Uh, the road provides access to the plateau on the Groot Winterhoek Mountains. Now, in winter, these mountains are covered in snow and, and can be quite cold. Um, there's, also, uh, okay, that's the, there's also a lawn site uh, of uh, hang gliders, which is very popular in the hang gliding fraternity. The road was upgraded to an asphalt road in the early 2000s, which makes it an easy drive but it's fairly steep at places. Um, as you can see on this photo, going up the pass, it's, uh, you've got to concentrate on where you're driving. Um, this, the road to Beaverlac is, as I said, is asphalt, um, and you must travel up to Beaverlac, and then uh, to leave it, you must uh, then come down the pass again. So this, there was, or there is axis on the other side of the mountain, um, going through to, Sierras, uh, out to Citrus Dal. Um, this is quite a hairpin bend, quite a dangerous hairpin bend that's on the pass. Um, and there you can see the road coming up down from the bottom, uh, coming up the mountainside, going up to Beaver Lake. Um, the road on the other side of the mountain that leads to Citrus Dal 
is mainly going through farm roads, uh, farms and farm roads. Uh, but unfortunately, the farmers has locked the gates uh, because these people that that drive over their farmland and uh, there's a general rule that you you don't speed through farm uh, gates and farm homesteads, but people don't adhere to the rules and it's an unwritten rule, but it makes the farmers fed up and they've unfortunately closed the gates. So that route is now not accessible. I've uh, also done some other routes in the Western Cape also. Uh, one of them is the old uh, postal route that runs between Bido Valley and Elon's Fontaine, which has also been closed uh, with the same reasons people driving through Farmstead and not adhering to rules. And unfortunately, we lost another pass there as well. But this is at the top of the Duster Pass where you get this information board where you then go down to Beaverlack, a nice camping site. Um, one of these days, I will still go camping there. So the dust slip pass will be written again. Good, then we move over to Prince Alfred's pass. Now, I think, and it's been said also that the Prince Alfred pass is probably Thomas Bain's greatest work. Now, Thomas Bain was a self-taught man, possessed a range of skills, including engineering, geology, cartography, art, writing, and accounting. Now, he was the son of Andrew Bay, uh, from whom he learned, he first learned past building techniques. Um, he drew his own maps and plotted his own lines on foot and sometimes on horseback. Now, the Prince Alfred Pass is extremely long and at 68.5 kilometers, it's the longest mountain pass in South Africa. Um, it's also known as the second oldest unaltered pass still in use. Um, okay, it lies between Neisner in the south and leads up to Unionville in the north. Now, I rode from Neisner. I did the trip in November last year, and I think in January, February this year, again, I took my son and another motorbiker on this trip. Um, yeah, it's a very, very nice road to travel on. Um, I went through Neisner on Komsepat, um, which uh, then leads you up to where you then join the Prince Alfred Pass. Um, and the Komsepat is, is through the bush where Dalian Matei Matia wrote that book of hers, uh, Kringen the Boss, I think that the book was now. And there's this talk of elephants that still hurt uh, those mountain bushes, but yeah, no one knows. Um, they say there is one or two elephants still left there. Um, I don't know if it's true, but yeah, it would be very nice if one drives through there and actually seeing one of those elephants. Um, en route to the Flug, these trumpets appear along the road and it was a commission of an artist uh, from straight on from the Merwe and it's called Calling the Herd. Now what these are and you can see the bottom side of those uh, pillars. There's like a trumpet uh, that you blow into. And uh, the idea is, is to call the herd. It's also calling, called calling the herd, encouraging the elephants to return to the call as the ones that I think it's part of history. I don't think it will ever happen again. Um, yeah, so it's just an interesting uh, sight that, that one drives past. That's just a, uh, a rock that was placed there with uh, some explanation uh, about calling the herd. Right, you can see on this photo the retaining walls that was used um, to build the pass. Um, it's uh, still intact after, I think it's 150 years from when this pass was built. So, um, the rock formations um, that was used, or the rocks that was used to, to create these passes is still intact and still the road that, the new road that's been built over the old road is still being supported by these rocks. So the building of, of this pass was, was great engineering. Okay, uh, the Flug, there's uh, three or four houses that one can actually stay over. I've uh, previously uh, stayed over at Angie's G-Spot about eight years ago. 
uh, en route to the Bafiaans Kloof. En uh, in november I stayed at Angie's G-spot again. En uh, now in January, February as well. So it's a, it's a nice camping spot. They've got uh, tents, uh, clean ablution facilities, uh, some, it's a small pub. Um, also known that he's in competition with uh, Ronnie's sex shop, perhaps. But yeah, quite a nice place to stop over and sleep over. And uh, quite nice scenery along the way also. Um, this is the old house where Thomas Bain stayed while constructing the Prince Alfred's Pass. Now it's still, it's the original house that was built for him. And uh, well, I think he also was involved in the building of it. And he spent about four years uh, staying in this house while building the pass with convicts. Um, I've seen a story that his daughter might have fell down those steps and was unfortunately passed away uh, because of the accident. Um, yeah, very sad story. The house has been occupied at this stage by uh, someone that's renting a farm there. And uh, I walked up to the road uh, and got to the house where I took this photo and I chatted to the guy and he says, yeah, it's a very old house, very nice house to stay in, but he was busy with some cows down at the bottom. So we couldn't talk much about it. Right, this is just the information board at the Flucht where you get all the information of the uh, past and some information on it. Then the following morning, I left to Afontir, which is the, the second part of the journey. And you can see on this lovely photo, it's like a port that you're passing through with the rock formations all along the road. There's also some waterfalls coming down the road with the river flowing down, um, which uh, gives you very nice scenery. Again, as I said right in the beginning, traveling by motorbike makes it much easier to stop and enjoying the scenery and taking in what, what nature throws at you here. Again, you can see the walls here where the pass is being held up from the riverbed. And then as you go up to the mountain, just before crossing over to Afontir, you get this lovely view of the valley going down uh, to the Flucht. And you can see in the right hand side also the pass cutting through the mountain there. Uh, very, very beautiful scenery indeed. Right, then the next, on my way back, um, I drove from Afantir to Oetswaring. And then you get the Oetenikwa Pass between Oetswaring and George. Now, the Oetenikwa Pass is a fairly new pass, relatively modern new connecting Oatwilling and George, um, and just basically a road going from the top of the mountain down to the sea. It was built by a local council um, between 1942 and 1951. So unfortunately, no famous names involved in this, but uh, yeah, quite a nice pass to drive through. And then at the stop points where you get alongside the pass, you look onto the old Montague Pass, which is a, a very narrow pass and uh, very dangerous actually for traffic to travel that road up and down. Um, also a very nice pass to travel with a motorbike. Um, all of these passes can be done with, with normal vehicles. It's not necessary to have an extreme four by four to do these roads. Um, yeah, the, the Otenikwa pass is quite a steep pass um, also and uh, weather conditions uh, makes it one of the passes that's that's quite dangerous to travel and often gets closed uh, if there's high winds blowing and or snow falling. It's one of those mountains that also get quite a lot of snow in winter time. Um, this is also just uh, the road coming from the top going down. Uh, very beautiful. As I said, all the passes in the Western Cape has got extremely beautiful scenery and we are truly blessed with, with that. Good, then we, we move on to the old Hoog Pass. Now, we live in Hermanus, um, which is uh, at the southern, close to the southern tip of the African continent. I think we're about 250 kilometers from Cape Agulhas, which is the southernmost tip of the African continent. 
Now the old hoe pass is, is, is we say in our backyard um, and uh, quite a nice pass to travel. It's relatively short. I think it's about five kilometers with the whole pass traveling down from Hot River up to Hoook, close to the Hoook farm store where you exit the pass onto the N2. Now, as I said, a, a favorite pass for me, and it's, it's close by and quite nice to drive. It's a well-designed pass, also known as the railway pass. Um, but it's unfortunately, this is one of the passes that's only suitable to travel with a four by four. It's a very narrow road, so your vehicle might be scratched as you uh, go through the bushes. Uh, it's not being kept well. So unfortunately, you can see on this photo from last year, October, when we had the rain, the road washed away quite badly and it's still in a bad situation there. So I had quite a sweat going up here with the motorbike, but uh, well, luckily I'm, I think I've, I've got it under the knee and uh, I've got the confidence to travel these roads. You can also see on this road, on this section of the pass that it's, uh, it's quite deteriorated. Um, you can also do it with a bicycle, but uh, yeah, you gotta be very fit to do this road. At the top of the photo, you can see the bend there of the new Ho Pass going down to Bot River. So on various points on the new Ho Pass, you can look down onto the old um, Ho Pass. And this pass was built one of, it was one of four roads uh, getting to the Overberg. And, and this is also one of the passes that was built to get down to the Overberg. And it was, uh, com it was constructed in 1904 to complement the railway line. Now, this is just uh, a nice uh, rock formation where you just go up the pass from Bot River side and you look over the valley back to Caledon. And in the far distance, you can see the wind uh, turbines of uh, Caledon. On this uh, photo, you can see the railway line at the left-hand side and the road follows uh, the railway line, basically the lines of it uh, being a service road nowadays for the railway lines. Uh, when I traveled this, it was about a month ago, it was actually one of the, the wagons that was derailed and there was workers uh, busy getting it back on track. So it is uh, accessible then to the railway line. Um, the the Jakobs River is running down uh, in the ravine there, which you can see on the left where the green belt is um, and it, it flows eventually into the Bot River. Now, the railway line is just below the pass road there, the gravel road, and uh, yeah, it's also very nice and beautiful scenery that you get there. This is uh, close to the top of the pass where one of the railway bridges is, which you actually can get close to. There's three railway bridges in the close vicinity here. The other two is uh, further down the valley, but not as easy accessible as this one. Um, yeah, so this is at the top of the pass where you end up at the end to um, going to the tar road. Um, and this is where you exit it. As you can see, the bushes along the road is unfortunately not kept back and uh, yeah, scratches on, on vehicles is, is going to happen. Uh, then I traveled back to Hermanus on the new Howard Pass, and you can see the summit is about 340 meters. Now, standing at this point, you can then, if you stop here again, as I said, easy to stop with a motorbike, with the carts, but a little bit more difficult with traffic passing. But you, know, as you stand here and you look down uh, to the old pass, you can see the railway bridge there. And in the far distance, you can see the other bridge. I know it's there. Um, and that uh, lookout point, that parking spot, uh, is where I took that previous photo where you can actually see that uh, bridge. Right, then in our next edition, uh, we will be covering the Franzhoek Pass, which is between Felizdorp and Franzhoek Pass. Uh, Franzhoek, the town, which was also called Elephant's Corner. But that's, that's all detail we'll get onto in the next uh, edition of the Mountain Passes of the Cape. Um, 
also quite a nice path to drive. Can be dangerous. Um, a lot of traffic goes up and down that pass nowadays. Uh, unfortunate for us, a lot of trucks use it as well, which makes it also dangerous. Uh, on the top right photo, you can see a rock fall that I think that happened about two or three years ago. Uh, there was a young lad with his girlfriend that actually was struck by those rocks uh, when they get, went through there. So yeah, can be dangerous, uh, but a very, very beautiful pass to cross over. Right, as John said, there's some keen photographers and we are blessed with the whales here in Hermanus as well. And uh, just some of the information on the left where we got all of this information from. Good, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, I think there will be time for questions. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Right. Thanks everyone. Back, back to you, Henny. And um, I guess we'll try and unload here. Martin can sit down and, and take questions. Right, everybody with questions, uh, stick up your hand or just come online. Maybe I can just ask uh, Martin, you know, you say those places are locked. Uh, I was particularly interested in going over the old Picanus Pass in that area into Citrus Dull. Um, yes. So you can't perhaps phone ahead or, or find out who the guys with the locks are and uh, arrange it. It's just a question of it. You know, isn't it? Isn't there some legal issues, or aren't there some legal issues here? I think they can't close the roads if if I'm right. Um, it is roads that, that should be accessible for people, but the farmers got so fed up with the people um, using the roads and and misusing them and destroying what's on the roads, that, that they will take their chances in locking those gates. And uh, yeah, I don't think there's much one can do. I've, uh, I've spoken to some of the people on these passes and um, there's also people from Oppiberg. Uh, there's a pass going to the Transburg pass that was also closed. And the people said, well, whoever wants to fight us must come and fight us. We've got our points and uh, it's our farms that get destroyed. Um, unfortunately, uh, security risk is also in their favor, so they can say that it's dangerous if we leave the gates open that unlawful people can actually get on our land and we know all now know about farm murders, so that is a major concern with these farmers. Yeah, you know, with us having too many irons in the fire, we're going to task you with the next solution of this one. Well, why don't you start gathering uh, contacts of these guys and then we work a system like you know, a gate key pass where you start on one end with a key that fits all in your hand and back at the other end. So you actually go through a gated community, uh, but it gives you access, you know, make it available on demand type of thing. Have you thought about a group, you know, a group? You've muted yourself, Martin. Okay. okay, that's unmuted. Um, yeah, I'm quite sure if, if one goes to the farmers and talk to them about it, uh, but it's got to be strict access control um, and, and responsibility. And that, I'm quite sure if one goes with that to them, they, they will be listening to, to the proposition. Because I, I, why I'm saying so is in the Kalahari, that system worked quite well. And even during the Bush War, I'm not the Bush War, the, the war in, in, in uh, northern in, in, in Namibia. You know, there was uh, close to the Tasha, the farmers there had several gates and you, you had by by word of mouth and by booking ahead, you could do this because, I mean, we, we're sort of taking away from these lovely secrets that you've now unveiling, you know, revealing to us. I didn't even knew some of these passes existed. Yeah, yeah. The, the problem is, them. yeah, the problem with what's happened and I've, I've had a key um, to going to the Steenbras Dam. Now you trust a friend and he tells a friend and, and it later on gets out of hand that there's too many people knowing about the key. Um, yeah. and, and that makes it difficult. So yeah, one's got to control it very strictly and, and be very responsible about it. And I'm quite yeah. sure if, if one handles it like that, it can work, absolutely. 
Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we must come together on this one afterwards and we can work out a system. Okay, that we'll do. Martin, you talked about the pass that runs, what well, used to run in parallel to where some Solaris Pass is now. But you can access that pass from the Grabo side as well. Is that correct? You, you can, yes. Um, I just know that's part of Cape Nature, and Cape Nature is also not keen of having people on their property. Um, but if you park at the Steenbras, uh, opposite the Steenbras Dam gate on the N2, just before you go over Salori's Pass, if you travel from Grabo towards Somerset West, the parking spot is on the right hand side, just as you go up the mountain. And from there on, you can hike up to the Ghanto Pass uh, that, that leads over the mountain there that used to be the old pass. Um, I know there are gravel roads that goes through that section of, of land there, but as I said, that's uh, Cape Nature and they, they're not very keen of people driving there. I know that I've, or I tried in the, in the distal, previously tried to get access on those roads and they told me that uh, the bowling club at Grabo, you can get a permit. So I think with a four by four, there is still access to those roads once you've got a, a permit that you get from, from Cape Nature or from the bowling club in Grabo. Um, I tried my best to, to travel there with my motorbike and I just got a thousand no's. So they don't want any motorbikes on the premises, but I'm quite sure you can do still do it with a four by four. Yes, correct. I know quite a few friends here from Hermanas have done that with their four by fours via the bowling club. So that's correct. Yes, yeah. So I think the four by four clubs will have information about that. Uh, um, I've also got a, a Subaru Forester that I can do those roads, but I'm not uh, keen on traveling in my vehicle doing these uh, roads close by. So I'm more of a motorbike explorer, but time will come when, when I will have to revert back to the 4x4. I also see some of the slides uh, you have there with, with information on it. Some of them say Cape Mountain Passes .co .z, and the other one says Mountain Passes South Africa .co. Are there two, are these two websites that one can, can uh, fruitfully use in terms of exploring it and for accommodation and so on or are they absolutely you know? yes absolutely yeah. you can um, you can use both of those websites they are uh, very informative um, and I, I don't think there's a lot of information about uh, campsites and sleepovers but uh, we've accumulated information over the years and when and as I drive past these places I I usually stop and get information. Uh, interestingly enough, about a month ago, uh, on the way to, to Mount Cedar, I've uh, heard of a place called the Zoo Reach, uh, which is uh, about 25 kilometers north of Opiberg. And they've, they've got a house there that you can actually uh, sleep over. And then they've also got a campsite uh, where you can uh, stay over. So I've, I've heard of that. and. Uh, it's a, it's a new place that we visited, and I will surely, and I think in the next edition, also touch on that because it's a very, very nice place to go and visit. Um, but yeah, those two websites uh, give quite a lot of information. On that point, I mean, Martin would be more than willing, you know, to pass on information, and maybe it's something we, we you know, we also, when our website's up and running, you know, we'll have a, a, a mountain pass um, section. A key, a sec section, absolutely. And, you know, Martin can add information to that. Well, I was coming to that. I was going to say, having sight now of a third edition, I think the next logical thing is because you're sitting right next to one of them, is that when you are going over a pass, you can say, well, this is the package, you know, uh, pass with on the air. We have this and that for info formation that you part you're still in the cape fold belt or you are now you know going over granites so that we bring in the geology into this thing while we're traveling as well well how about that john no you, you're speaking to the converted henny and interestingly you know some people will be aware but not everyone um, cameron penn clark who's at the cgs council for geoscience he's 
I think now built the first prototype um, app um, you can use on your cell phone to all our amazing, you know, geoheritage or, or, or geological locations, like the sort of stuff that, you know, we've been talking at last uh, talking about last week. And, and, you know, Martin hasn't also mentioned that every one of these passes, you know, actually has some amazing geology. I mean, you see it in his images. So, so that, you know, that's definitely another layer that needs to be added all to this, um, because as you and I have discussed, Henny, we've been very poor, um, you know, salesmen for our remarkable geology in, in the Western Cape or for that matter, South Africa. Yeah, you know, they're, there are various books and there are, you know, various articles, but someone, or at least Cameron with his app, is now starting to pull that together. Um, you know, and, and I guess that's also something we're involved with. I mean, we really need to tie the tourism potential to the geological potential to the, you know, to the 4 by 4 potential, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, we'll get there. Okay, I think that sort of. If there are no more questions, uh, I think we. we I'd like to on. toss a question, if I may. Sure. Carry on. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Martin. I, I, uh, I was the guy who asked you the question on your first presentation about doing the passes on an RT as opposed to a GS, and. Um, and your first talk really whetted my appetite, even just to do the black stuff passes. But I, uh, and in fact, coincidentally, I had scheduled to ride down leaving Johannesburg today to come and meet up with my son in Joburg and write a couple of passes. But I was going to do it solo. And when I went and spoke to a motorbike guy, he said, oh, you're crazy and punctures and all that. Do you go solo? Do you have a backup rescue plan or do you carry a wingman? Yeah, I, we, we usually travel two or three guys in, in a group. I'm not a group people um, type of person. I prefer traveling on my own. And um, the other thing is, is I stop quite a lot taking a lot of photos. And not everybody is into that and gets irritated. Um, I find that a lot of people travel between point A and point B and misses everybody, everything in between. Now I've got a different attitude about that. I, I stop a lot and uh, I've, I've often done some trips that's about 40 kilometers that we've traveled and they spent about two and a half hours spend, uh, spending on that 40 kilometers distance. Wow. So, okay. so I do stop a lot. Um, I now I've got a, a puncture kit that I drive with me, and I've got a, also a compressor. So uh, if needed, uh, one can do repairs. Um, I do quite a lot of solo traveling. Um, I've done the Prince Alfred Pass in November. I've done solo, and and one's just got to be very careful and responsible for your own safety, and uh, be aware of what you're doing when you're traveling. Um, I also travel at low speeds uh, on gravel roads and passes like that. Uh, I catch myself traveling between 40 and 60 kilometers an hour. So yeah. I don't do the speed thing, uh, which then gives you also the benefit of, of making less mistakes, I think. Uh, I've got some, I think I've got some quite good experience on gravel roads and I, I feel comfortable. And the level of comfort comes yeah. with experience, I think. Um, yeah, but it's always better to travel two guys up. It's yeah. much better to have a, a yeah, my partner with my, me. My concern was not even so much on the passes, but, uh, you know, I was going to go sort of by Uppington and getting a puncture halfway between Bruntflay and Calvinia, you could wait there for six <laughs> days before somebody <laughs> rescued you. Yeah. No, but you must you must teach yourself to to handle bank punctures. Um, <laughs> interesting, we did the 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 hell trip that we did quite a few years ago, and I had uh -huh. like a workshop in my garage, and I I invited three or four guys, and I said we're going to do the exercise of taking off the wheel of the motorbike, taking out the tube, and do a repair, and putting it all together, and and one of the guys actually pinched the tube three times uh, before putting it back. So it's, it's something you've got to exercise because it can happen. 
Um, yeah. The other advantage nowadays is you phone your insurance and they will send out someone that can, <laughs> can come and you. <laughs> Especially if you're on Toro between up and down. Yeah, they're not very responsive over the Easter weekend, I don't think. <laughs> uh, I don't want to promote any insurance companies, but get another insurer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now Anthony Thanks for the comments. Yeah, we'll, we'll send you Martin's contact details, phone him. You know, he'll gladly come and rescue you, uh, rescue you around Uppington area. Yeah, interesting. I'd do, we, the, I'd do the same for a biker, yeah. Yeah, we, we have been uh, called a few times trying to or ask to assist bikers. And interesting, I'm also on the Wild Dogs uh, Forum, which is a motorbike oh, yes. forum. And uh, okay. uh, there's a lot of time people go onto the forum and say, listen, we're stuck between this and there. And is there someone in the area that can help? Um, I had three or four years ago, I had a friend that was going on the Nordias Pass and they had a flat tire there. Ah. And uh, I went onto the Wild Dog site and I said, is there someone in that area? And within 15 minutes, someone actually stopped at this guy and helped him out. So I think now in response, Facebook and social media. Was that in response media, to your call? In response. Yes, just going on to the forum. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, and I think social media and Facebook and WhatsApp nowadays, so positive, yeah. um, one can yeah. always be in contact with almost anybody everywhere. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's certainly anyway, a lot good point. I mean, I've done I a lot of fixing of, of uh, punctures on four by fours, you know, about plugging and the thing like that. But my bike is a tubeless. And uh, yeah. So, yes. I've got some stuff. Oh, but you get a nice tubeless and, kit that you can. Yeah. Fuck yes. it and the plug. Yeah. But that works really, very well. And no, do you, but you, you must you carry a compressor. Old but it's, it's fairly easy. You carry a compressor. I was told to go and okay. get these, yeah. these gas bombs that you. Do you use those at all? Because my compressor is yeah. too big to get it in my no. luggage. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can get a small comp uh, 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 compressor that, that can fit into your toolbox. Um, I've used those gas bombs twice and without su success both times. Uh, um, the, the problem is it was heat. It was quite hot when we traveled. Uh, and then they're just not up to the point where you can get inflation of it. So okay. I don't trust them. I don't even have them in my bag. I'll take them back to the cellar then. <laughs> yeah, they're quite expensive as well. <laughs> I noted that, yes. yes. Anyway, Martin, good. Nice to hear you talk, and I won't hog any more of the time, but nice comments. Thank you very much. Good. And then I'd, I'd like to see some of the passes that you've done. Well, yeah. zero at this stage, except in my four by fours. Yeah. <laughs> then it's time to get on your bike and do it. <laughs> Before it's too late. Positive note, guys. Thank you very much. We all see you next Thursday, same place, different topic. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kurt. I'll get back to you as well. Bye Thanks, Pete. Good to see you. Okay.